Thank you so much, uh, Emily, for hosting us in a such beautiful bookstore and discover it. And it's really lovely to be here. Thank you so much for coming. I know people have so many things to do in New York City. I'm here since one month, and I discovered that uh, every everyone is uh, always on hurry. And uh, so, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Alexandra, also, uh, to to uh, took time to took time to read my book. And I want to tell you that um, uh, I just started, as you see, learning, learning English six months ago. So please be very patient with me. <laughs> it's difficult for me, but I, I would like to try to do it in English, even if Alexandra is speaking very, 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 very well French. But uh, we, we try to do it in English. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you all. Thanks for thanks for having me and, and us in this beautiful room. Um, I'm just so happy that it's a full house because I was thinking that this is such an American imperative to try to pursue happiness, even if we don't get there tonight, but I'm hoping that we get a little bit closer via help from the French. Um, I took my phone out only because <coughs> I was noticing as I was taking the subway up here, something that I bet a lot of people in this room have seen many times, which is this ad for a free philosophy school. Have you seen this? And I, I, I've seen this so many times, and I've wondered what this is. And then tonight, looked a little closer, and it, the school says, the aim of philosophy is to set people free, free from pressure and free from worry, free to grow, free to, free to be themselves, and free to be happy. I agree. <laughs> and, and I want to know, is that the aim of philosophy, to be free, to be happy? How did you come to this topic? Is this an imperative for all of us? I wanted that uh, the first aim of uh, philosophy is to be happy. I will say that the first goal of philosophy uh, is to search the truth. You say the truth, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, to search the truth. And uh, Maybe the second aim of happiness is to be happy. But you can find philosophers uh, like uh, Socrates who said that uh, it's most important to try to have a good life than a happy life. And maybe sometimes you can renounce to be happy because you think it's better to, to do justice, to, to love someone, and it will be difficult for you. And Socrates, at the end of his, of his life, uh, his disciples say, you have to leave. Don't, don't uh, uh, take the present. You can live happy for many years. And he said, I don't want to do it. Because I always said that I have to follow the rules of the city, even if the rules are bad. And I want to be current. I want to, to do what I did. What I said. Though you could say that, if not to in interrupt you, but maybe the thing that gave him the most happiness was in fulfilling his own principles. We can say that. And it's another it. way of. Uh, but maybe uh, you you can be happy if you are doing what you think is the best. But sometimes it's it's difficult. I will give you another example. Nelson Mandela. He was for so many years in jail. Of course, he was happy to fight for justice, but I think it was not very pleasant to be in a jail for so many years. And it's the same for Gandhi, it's the same for Martin Luther King. Many people who fight for justice, uh, they, they are very difficult moments. But they do it because they think it's more important. Uh, the most important value for them is love, is justice, and not to search egotistic happiness. But I agree with you, even if you are doing that, not searching happiness, you can feel something like happiness. Maybe it's not happiness in the same way we, were, we will speak. It's a kind of joy. Uh, you feel joyful because you know that you are doing well. Um, but it's not exactly the definition, uh, the philosophical definition of happiness, uh, which is uh, something that you try to, uh, I mean, you are searching for um, a balance, a harmony for peace. You are searching to be in a balanced life and you try to moderate pleasures and you try to, to be always in peace. 
that I, I think the well, I'm what glad, I say. I'm glad you go there because the first problem in talking about happiness, actually the first problem in thinking about happiness, which is what I've been doing for the past few days, is to define what we're talking about when we talk about happiness. And if you put it that way, if you say that it's about reaching a sense of peace with yourself, the first thing that you notice is that it's a long-term imperative, that it's very hard to judge maybe in a given moment if you're happy or you're not happy. Even though you can feel happy, you can identify yourself as feeling happy, but, and I think this is something that comes across in your book, it's, it's hard to know if you're happy. That's the, that seems like the first problem we have. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, as I, as I um, said in my book, uh, a sentence from uh, um, uh, Prévert, who said, um, I, um, I heard the noise of happiness when it, it was going back. So most of when the it, time... When it left. When it left. Yeah. When it left, sorry. <laughs> when it left. And most of the time, we realize that we were happy because we, we are now unhappy. Uh, when we have a big problem, uh, we lost, we lose our job, uh, we we uh somebody die and thing like that we say oh, i was so happy before these hardships of life and of course that we can realize that we are that we are happy because unhappiness exists that the contrast uh, between happy uh, happiness and unhappiness that can uh, that can show us what is happiness. Uh, it's the same for everything. You can know what is light because there is a dark. Uh, you can know uh, everything by the contrast. Uh, but uh, also I think that uh, uh, you can, if you are searching for happiness, and if you decide in your life to be happy, uh, and then you can try to um, know you better. You can do a work to be happier. I think it's possible. That's what uh, ancient uh, Greek philosophers said. That's what Spinoza said. That's what the Buddha said. And most of the greatest philosophers, they thought it's possible to be happier, to grow in happiness. You can decide it. They say, I remember Aristotle in uh, Nicomachus Ethic, Ethics, he said that uh, happiness is for half pa a part of, um, I would say, luck. He, he doesn't say luck. He said uh, the, the grace of God or something like that. He said that the divinity gives you uh, a, good, uh, a good diamond, uh, like a good star. Uh, and he said for the half, it's your decision, what you are doing in your life. So maybe some people, uh, the, their life is difficult because they have, we can say, bad genes, you know, today. Uh, they are not lucky. Uh, they are bad parents. Uh, their life was difficult at the beginning, and so all the all the, their life is difficult. And also, people are very pessimistic and depends on the character of the genes. But even for those people, it's possible to be happier if you decide to do it, and if you make the thing for that. For example, you can to go on therapy. You can to meditate. You can to know you better. There are many ways that can help you to feel better, and then you, if you decide to be happy, I'm sure you, everyone can be happier. Well, in a way, this is kind of the, the, the blessing and the curse of this whole subject. It's the best and the worst part of it, because I was noticing something in your book where you were citing studies of happiness and satisfaction, and researchers had found that researchers have found is such an ambiguous phrase these days, but let's go with it for a second, that research, researchers had found that your genetic Disp ge genetic makeup and predisposition is a huge part of in an innate capacity for happiness. That external circumstance and situation is is not such a big deal, which is interesting to me because I've always thought that changing your changing your location, your job, your situation can be one of the biggest things to change your happiness. And then then there's this kind of strange, hard to define personal factor. So I say it's the blessing and the curse because. I, if one is empowered to seek happiness, great, but how, how do you even go about doing it? How have you gone okay. about doing it? What I mean, I think, I think maybe I'd like to hear it, and okay. maybe other people would about <laughs> would what brought you, you here. I will tell you, first of all, I want to, to say something about what you just said about the external factors. Because most of people think that external factors are the most important for happiness. You say, oh, if you if you born in a rich country with uh, democratic rules, and then 
of course it will be much easier to be happy than if you were born in a poor country and, and it's not true because uh, you can find everywhere in the world I, I was traveling in Africa, in Asia, everywhere you can find happy and unhappy people everywhere uh, it doesn't depend first on the external factor of course if the external factors are terrible if you can't eat it will be difficult to be happy but if you can have a roof if you can eat, if you have people around you and most of the people can be happy. So uh, external factors are, uh, are not so important. What is more, more important is uh, what we said, the genes uh, and uh, the, ed the um, uh, education, or no, not education, gro growing up. Mm -hmm. the, way, the way you brought up. The way you brought up. And also uh, the decision. And I will, uh, I will say that uh, if, you, if you try to, to be happy, and then if you get happiness inside you, because the difference, I would just say, uh, the difference between pleasure and happiness, that's the beginning of, of the beginning. Uh, the, the concept of happiness was created by Epicurus and Aristotle, and they distinguish it to the concept of pleasure. They said that pleasure is a short life experience, and happiness is a state of being. It's not an emotion. It's something holistic and durable. It's a, it's a state of being. And they say, uh, to be happy, you need pleasure. There is no happiness without pleasure. But like Epicurus said, you have to moderate pleasure. If you want to, be, to have full of pleasure, all the pleasures, you won't never be happy. Because in your life, if you want to be happy, you have to make choice. You have to decide what is the most important for you. You have to have a meaning in your life. When you have a meaning in your life, when you give a meaning to your life, then you can decide what is important for you, what is not important, and then you can choose the good pleasure for you. What is the good pleasures? What are the good pleasures for you? And uh, second thing they say that uh, you have to be virtue, virtues, and virtue is a middle path between two extremities. And so they explain that if you are virtuous, if you have ple pleasure and moderation, and uh, if you make some spiritual spiritual exercise also, uh, you know, in the ancient uh, Greek time, they meditate, they make introspection. Uh, we forget that, but it was school of wisdom, and they were practicing. And if you do all those kind of things, then you will be happy. Uh, and happiness means to be always, for them, means to be always in peace. You feel well with yourself because you love life, you agree with, you agree with life, and you don't say, oh, I, I, I would like uh, that some, something happened, but it didn't happen, and I'm unhappy. No, you say okay to life. And then even if you are sad, even if there are bad things, even if uh, something happened you didn't want, you can be sad, but you won't lose the peace. And I can say that... You have that no regrets. Uh, no regrets, even no regrets. And I, I will tell you in true that I can say that really uh, because I know it. Uh, for example, yesterday, one of my best friends uh, committed suicide. And I, I have to come back to France tomorrow for her funeral. I feel so sad. I cry all the day, but I feel still in peace. Because I know that's life. And I, I agree with that. If I, if I didn't agree with that, I will feel very unhappy. And I can't say I'm not I'm unhappy. I can say I'm still happy, but I'm sad. It can be both. You can suffer, you can feel sad, and you can be happy. It means it mean I love life. And then I know that I'm serene, whatever happened. I think it's a kind of definition of happiness. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious a little bit, going back into something you were just saying about this question of choice, um, because it seems that happiness depends so much on a certain kind of balance between having choice but not having too much choice. That if you have too much choice, it's going to be impossible to figure out how to direct yourself, how to be satisfied, pleasure being a part of happiness, but satisfaction also being a part of happiness. Um, and if you don't have enough choice, you may not get to, you talk a lot in your book about this idea of nature and what, what each, what one person, I think you used the example of your niece at some point, who, I, th I think it's your, your niece, a young woman who, yeah, who, who wasn't happy at school, didn't like studying, um, decided that she would go work in a store, 
and didn't like that either and realized she was actually, she was attracted to school, it just hadn't been the right situation for her before and she, she realized through kind of trial and error what her nature was, what she actually wanted to pursue. Um, so this balance of having choice but not too much choice, yeah. That's a very important question. I think it's the difference between traditional world and modern world. In a, in a, when you travel in a traditional world, you can see in India, in many countries, you can see people that don't have choice. They are living all the time uh, the same way of living. They are in the little villages. They can't go outside. They can't do what they really want, but they are happy. They're happy because they have a very good connection with other people, with the community. Uh, they agreed with life. Uh, they agreed with the nature. They are in good connection with nature, with cosmos. And they are living in a holistic world. And then in that kind of way, they're happy because they agreed with that. But of course, <laughs> it's difficult when you want to do something different. When you want to, to, to go out and you can't. So, uh, in the modern world, that's exactly, exactly the opposite. Uh, we can do everything, we can uh, choose everything, but it's not so easy to be happy in that way. Because when you have too much question, too much possibilities, uh, you always ask, oh, uh, did I uh, do the, the right thing? Uh, what can I do better? And also something very important, in the modern world, there's like, um, an ideology of happiness. You have to be happy. Uh, it's an obligation. You have to realize, uh, realize sa vie. Um, Accomplish. Yeah, achieve the fullest achieve. of your life. Or you have to achieve your life. You have to have the better life you can have. And if you don't, you feel like a loser. <laughs> and so it's difficult to True. be a loser. And it's a reason why, you know, uh, there's big difference be, uh, also between France and America. Because in France, we don't like so much to say, I'm happy. We are very critical, very cy cynical, and we think that it's so difficult to be happy, then it's better to say, I'm unhappy. Mm -hmm. And all people, s when you ask them, how are you? They say, oh, not so good, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult, life is difficult, there are too, much, too many problems in the world, how can you be happy in that world? And, and uh, even if they are very happy. I know many people who are very happy, they love their life, but they always say, oh, it's so difficult. <laughs> and in New York City, it's exactly the opposite. Because <laughs> all the people I ask, they say, oh, I'm so happy, great, amazing life. And, so, <laughs> and I didn't feel it was very true. <laughs> Most of the time, I've seen they are so tired, you know? They work all the day, they are tired, they don't have time, they are busy, they, they are searching for money, for money. They are so tired, and they don't take take time to leave. So I think both are right. Uh, it's very important to be positive and you are very positive. And French were negative and it's not good. <laughs> but I think sometimes it's important to say it's difficult. I'm not so happy. Uh, I need help. Or maybe that time it's not so, so great. And you don't say that because if you say that, people will say you are a loser. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult. And I think that uh, it's important uh, sometimes to say, okay, happiness is not an obligation. If I can feel happy, if I can feel well, that's good. But sometimes it's difficult. And you can say to others, and, I, and now I will answer to your second question because it was very interesting because we can speak about Spinoza. And Spinoza is my favorite philosopher, the Dutch philosopher. And uh, the question of my niece, uh, who, who changed uh, her life because she decided to make sociological research, and uh, um, I was spoken, spoken about that because Spinoza is the first modern philosopher who really uh, understand what is modernity. And he said that modernity is, is to have choice, what you said. And then it, it will be very difficult. And he said if you want to be happy in modernity, uh, you can't only uh, live like in the traditional world, world uh, only by the community, the roots, and you have to find in yourself what is your deep nature. You have to discover by yourself who you are, really who you are. Not only uh, who you are by uh, the thoughts 
you think you are like that because your parents say you are like that because your education because the culture because and he said you have to go uh, au-delà above and beyond yeah um, beyond the it, beyond the growing up beyond the culture be, and to discover what you are what is your deep personal nature and for that you can use philosophy you can you can use reason and it's why uh, when you said the beginning philosophy can help us for happiness that's true in that way because if you think well you will you will know you better and you will live better but you have to think well uh, it's why freud freud you say freud uh, said that spinoza was the ancestor of psychoanalysis he discovers the unconscious and he said that we made what we made all the time is unconscious and we have to be conscious we have to know why we do this uh, and who we are and then when we discover uh, our deep nature uh, we will discover that uh, we are unhappy we, because we are not doing the right thing for us. He said that there is only one global moral law. Moral law. It's uh, the, glo the golden rules. Don't do to the others what you don't want uh, they do for, uh, with you. Okay? But after he said the important ethics is individual. There is only an individual ethics. That's to find for you what is good for you? What is bad for you? He said it's like eating. What is a good food for you? What is a bad food for you? And there is not only one food good for every people. Because each people are, has a different nature. And you have to find what is good for your mind. What is good for your heart. What is good for your body. And what is not good. And when you discover that you are unhappy, it's because your desire is not well oriented. You can say oriented? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you desire something which is not good for you. It's why you are unhappy. And he said that uh, if you want to be happy, you have to change your desires. He said the human being is a being of desire. And uh, what he said is very important. Because the Stoicians and uh, uh, Greek philosophers said when you, dis di when you discover that something is not good, you can just, by the will, you can change, you can move. And Spinoza say it doesn't work. Willness is not sufficient. It's not because you know that something is bad that you can change. He say if you want to change, you have to find, with a reason, another desire. Because only desires can help people to change. And, the, uh, and then he said, if you are uh, unhappy, it's because you have a bad desire, you have to find out another desire, something that will give you motivation, a meaning, and then you will change. And you will change and you will be happy. That's the example like I said or, with my niece. Or could it, true, but or, or could it also be, I mean, I'd like us to talk a little bit about the question of other people and the role of, because we're talking a lot about the self and happiness and this imperative on the self to seek happiness and to try to discover one's true nature, to try to discover the things that will fulfill the demands of one's true nature. And then there's this whole question of, what to do about other people. As you're talking now, I'm thinking, well, could one answer be, instead of changing your own desires, you find someone else who fits those desires. Oh, that's right. Or you, you find some kind of community that fits yeah. those desires. Of course. Uh, it's it's uh, the same with people. If I understand well your question, so he says, Spinoza, Spinoza said sometimes, of course, you are uh, unhappy because you are loving a people, uh, a person who is not good for you. And uh, so you have to 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 desire another person because uh, if you are with this person uh, that's for bad reason for unconscious reason and you will be always unhappy and uh, so uh, he said if you know you better you will discover by the reason that you are with a person which is not good for you it's like poison and he said, so with the reason you will discover that, and after you have to, to discover another person, which is good for you. And uh, it's a question of uh, to be free. Uh, you said that at the beginning that uh, philosophy can s uh, set, set, uh, set up free, mm -hmm. can make us uh, freer. And it's because when you know better yourself, 
you can do good choices. But of course it's difficult. But I think it's less difficult when you have another desire than, than if you want only to do it by will. It's funny because I have to confess that your point of reference is Spinoza and when I hear about, when I think about what it means to combine self-knowledge with reason and with a, an idea of other people seeking similar things, I know I wrote this to you in an email earlier as part of a general riffing on happiness, but you know, I'm, in some ways we're trying to set up the modern world to enable us to use some kind of self-knowledge to perfectly program it into a situation that will allow us to achieve the maximum amount of happiness. It's hard not to think of something like, you know, personality tests that will show us who we really are and fit us together with other people who feel the same way, or something like, um, like the dating site OkCupid that has a list of however many 150 questions that you answer so you can find exactly the kinds of people you're most compatible with. And in some ways it seems highly artificial and in other ways it seems like the epitome of what modern self-knowledge might actually be. Maybe. I don't know. I don't use, but uh, maybe it's right. <laughs> no, no, maybe it's right People because it, it, use, it use objective things, not only attraction. I think both are important. If you want to, to have good relationship with someone, and especially in love, I think you have to feel attraction. But I think also you have to have good reason to know that with this person, you can have a good connection, a deep connection, because you have many goals in common, you can uh, see life uh, in the same way, and I think it's important. Uh, both are very important, because if you have only the reasons, and you feel no physical attraction, it would be very difficult also. <laughs> I also I want to come back to something else also that um, that has a number of things have sat with me over the past few days as I've thought about happiness in your book on happiness. There's one very specific one, um, which is that in your book you talk about satisfaction and um, which I think we can agree is probably a component of happiness, but not synonymous with happiness. Um, and you say that. It has been found that in general, in various studies and surveys of people, that satisfaction goes, declines between the ages of 20 and 50, which I found unbelievably distressing, um, and, and then goes up again. And your explanation for this is that when you're a child, you know, generally you don't have an awareness of other things outside of your own experience, although children more and more in the modern world clear, clearly do. Um, the teenage years, I guess we won't discuss. Uh, and then that once you're at 50, you're in a good position to kind of look over what you've done with your life so far, but you're not so far along that you can't change things or act on those things. Um, and I also wonder, I was thinking about this and wondering as someone on the, who's not near the peak of the, of the trough, um, if, uh, you know, if this also has to do with questions of choice and questions of how to choose happiness, that you're trying to make choices that will both ensure, and I think this could probably apply at any point in life, that will both ensure your happiness in the present, but also will maximize your happiness in the future. Th those can be two completely different things. Uh, I would uh, answer by my own experience, because uh, I wa uh, now I'm much more happy than when I was a teenager or when I was 30. So uh, I am agree with the surveys that uh, um, happiness is uh, going up after 45 years and it's growing uh, because in my in my experience when I was a teenager I was not so happy I, w I was not unhappy but I was not so uh, so much happy because I, I had uh, many uh, problems with my uh, affective life and uh, it was difficult so I gone therapy and it it help, it helps me a lot and so I uh, learned meditation and I meditate since 30 years. It helps, it helps me, it's difficult to say, a lot. And then also uh, I discovered something very important that ma many people know it now, but 30 years ago it was not well known. Uh, that it's very important to focus on the present time to be very present to what you are doing. Because most of the time you are unhappy because you are anxious, you are nervous, you are thinking about the future, you are thinking about the past, but you are not living in the present time. And when you are very busy, um, sometimes you, you don't take the time to test, to smell, to, to enjoy life. And we can enjoy life any moment. And uh, when you are working, you can just say, oh, I enjoy my work. When you are 
uh, making cooking, I love cooking. Uh, if you are listening to the radio and speaking with others and thinking about the past, you won't have joy. So if you are cooking, just, just sweat, you are cooking and you are feeling, feeling when your sense, your sense is very important. If you feel with us, your senses, uh, the water, if you, the color of the fruits and uh, you do it, it's really a big pleasure. And then, then you will feel much better. Because if every day you, you are focusing on the, of the, all the little pleasure, pleasures of the day, you will feel much better. And what is strange is that all ancient philosophers said that. And now, cognitive science says the same thing. Because they make research and they see that when people are focusing, when they are living in the present time, they, they, their brain creates serotonin and uh, dopamine, uh, chemical substances, that, that produce well-being. So we can have the scientific explanation of what the philosophers said from the past that you have to focus on the present time. And I did it. So I feel now much better with meditation, with focusing, with trying to, to see good things, to have a positive way of uh, thinking. I'm more American than French by that way. Uh, <laughs> and then all of that uh, means that now I feel much better. And also I know me much better because I try to know me better by psychology and philosophy and I know what is good for me, what is bad for me. It's what uh, Carl Gustav Jung said, the process of individualization. And you, 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 you do it most of the time between 30 and 50 years old. Because at the beginning of your life you are doing a lot of things, you want to work, to have a job, to have a family, and you, you don't have time to think. And after, you, with your experience, you discover what is good, what is bad. And then you say, I want to change my life, I want to do something different. And what Spinoza said, you know you better and you know what is good for you, what is bad for you. And then most of the time, people change. And then they feel better after 45, uh, 50 years. So Help you are on the way. <laughs> no, you are on the good way. <laughs> you will grow in happiness. <laughs> it's better than to go down. <laughs> Very true. Um, with that, maybe we should take some questions? Anybody has an audience question this evening? I'd love to bring you the microphone. Hi. Hi. I was just wondering if you could speak for a minute about philosophers or maybe religions, if they exist, that see happiness as a false goal, as something that maybe doesn't exist or should not be sought after. Great. <laughs> because of course, in that book, I explain also philosophers who said that happiness doesn't exist. And uh, for example, uh, Freud said uh, pleasure exists and people when they, when they think they are searching for happiness they are only searching for pleasure. And they confuse pleasure and happiness. Because he didn't believe in what Epicurus and Aristotle and Spinoza said that we can have a durable and holistic state of being that, that we call happiness. Freud say we are always up and down, always. Uh, I don't agree with Freud from my own experience, but that's uh, what he said, and he tried to explain it. Uh, also, uh, uh, I told you Socrates before, and Socrates and other philosophers like Kant, Kant said happiness is not, it, it's good to be happy, but it, it must not be the aim of life, the goal of life. Uh, it's more important to, to search for love, uh, for justice, for other things than happiness. And if you are happy, it's good. But you don't have to, to have this quest. It will be second. And I think that Jesus is not a philosopher, a spiritual master, but he says the same thing. Love is more important. You have to search love, to search the truth. And if you are happy, it's, it's good. And, uh, but if you are not because you, you give your life for people, and uh, it's better to, to help people. So I think that there are many philosophers who didn't believe in happiness. Schopenhauer is a good example. But Schopenhauer, the problem with Schopenhauer explain that it's impossible to be happy uh, because uh, human being can't identify what he's doing for. So he said that uh, uh, what he, he was not agree with Spinoza. 
he was the opposite. And he said that uh, you just know what is happy when you when you feel unhappy, you discover happiness because you are unhappy and uh, the opposite, what, like we said before. Uh, but also, Schopenhauer was were very unhappy all his life. You know, so it's strange because when you read philosophers and when you know the life of philosophers, you find out that the philosophers who were happy said, oh, happiness does exist. And the philosophers who were unhappy said, no, it doesn't exist. <laughs> so I think we make philosophy with our own experience. We have to be very humble. If a philosopher said, I have the truth for everyone, you, mm, I'm not sure. I think that philosophy also, you make philosophy with your mind, with your reason, but also with, with your sensitivity with your sensibility, with a lot of things which are human. And um, if you are positive, if you think positive, you will have the different view uh, upon life that if you are pessimistic. Other questions? Um, you said that it, because you define happiness as serenity or harmony, uh, you said it's possible to be happy and at the same time sad. But that sounds odd in English because we do think of happy and sad as opposites, as contraries. So there are some uh, uh, people who, um, who study Aristotle who say that it's what he, what's often called happiness in what he was writing about eudaimonia, it's, it's better to think of it as flourishing rather than the word happiness to think in terms of flourishing as the goal. Uh, what do you think of that? Uh, I don't know the meaning of this word. Flourishing, thriving, um, being in a... Uh, what? Un épanouissement. Okay, I would say that uh, because they don't... I, I agree because I think those people who say the word of happiness, it's impossible to say to be sad and, and happy. Because they have an, undes an understanding of happiness which is, which is not mine or which is not the, the one of uh, Aristotle or Spinoza. Because the, the, I think they understand happiness like, like something, oh, I feel so great, very well all the time. It's not that. Happiness is just to be in peace. It's just to be serene. It's just to agree with life. And you can feel sad and be serene in the same time. Happiness is not, not, it's not to be joyful all the time. It's just to say, I'm okay. I'm okay with me, I'm okay with life, I'm okay with the world. And then when you feel that, you can, I think, agree with everything. But it's difficult to, to, to go to that kind of serenity. And that's for me happiness. It's not something very exuberant. It's something very strong inside yourself. And when you feel that, you can be happy everywhere, whatever happens. I will give you, I will tell you a little story. Uh, it's a story, uh, it's a story of um, a tradition, uh, how you say, uh, um, I don't remember, uh, Sufism. You know Sufism? Yeah. yeah. It's a Sufi story. It's a, a man who comes in a new city and uh, he doesn't know everyone. And he, he asks to an old man, there is an old man sitting in the door of the city, and he say, tell me, old man, uh, how are the people in this city? Are they nice? Are they bad? And the old man said, how were the people in the city you live, you left? And this man said they were very bad. And the old man say, here, it's the same. <laughs> and the man say, oh, I'm not lucky, everywhere I, I go, there are bad people. And 10 minutes after, come another man, a stranger, a foreigner. He asks the same question. And the old man says the same question. How were the people, the city you left? And he said, oh, very kind, very sympathetic. And then the old man say, here, it's the same. And there is a merchant, camel merchant, and he heard the conversation. He, he's coming to the old man and he said, but you are lying. How can people in this city be at the same time kind or bad? And then the old man said, it doesn't matter. What, the, what is important is that uh, if you are happy somewhere, you will be happy everywhere. If you are unhappy somewhere, you will be 
unhappy everywhere. So just try to find happiness inside yourself and it will stay everywhere with you. That's the search, the philosophical search of happiness. And spiritual. Any other questions? This will be our last one for the evening. You brought up both uh, reason and meditation. How would you rate or how would you say which contributes in what way to coming to that state of happiness you're talking about? Uh, I don't understand. You mentioned that r both reason and meditation help you get to this place of happiness. Uh, the two seem very different. How would you say that each contributes? Okay, I would say reason contributes by two ways, philosophy, because philosophy helps me to, to think better, and psychology. Because with psychology, I try also, but like, uh, like uh, Spinoza said, with philosophy, but it was for me uh, in, in psychology. I try to find out who I am, how it works inside me, why I do that kind of thing, why I do always this, the same mistakes and things like that. So the reason helped me in that, in that way to know me better. And meditation, it was very different. Meditation helped me to have a distance with my emotional and with my thought. Because most of the time, if we don't meditate, we don't have distance. When someone comes in the street and tell you uh, something bad, and you are very angry and you feel emotion. And if you meditate, you won't, because you have the distance. You are used in meditation every day for one hour, or you can, you can do less. You are used to observe your emotion and to observe your thought. And then when an emotion <coughs> or thought came, you don't say, I'm okay with this. You, you just observe. And you say, okay, this emotion is good, I go inside. Maybe sometimes it's good to be, hang to be angry. It's good. Sometimes not. It would destroy you or somebody else. Uh, you, you will have the freedom to say, I'm okay with this emotion or, or I'm not okay. That's what gives me the meditation. And I will give you an example. 20 years ago, I had a problem with a book uh, because I wrote all the book on my computer. And then, at the end, I made a big mistake and I lose everything. <laughs> and I was so, so, it, you can understand what it is. It's horrible. It's the most horrible thing that can happen to a writer. <laughs> Much more m horrible than uh, everything else. Every kind of sickness, it doesn't matter. This is terrible. And I was so unhappy for so many months. And it happens quite the same thing with this book. Uh, one year and a half ago, I wrote three very important and difficult chapters. Because I make a comparison between uh, Taoist philosophers and Montaigne. It was so difficult to do it. And Spinoza, the most important chapter, same mistakes. I put on my key and I, I had another key. I put the bad one and I, 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 everything was lost. <laughs> and I was very unhappy for about 30 seconds. <laughs> and after, I lost. And I say, that's life. <laughs> and then I realize that I move in happiness. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's give Frederick and Alexandra a hand for joining us tonight.